know what? I never noticed this, but my pet bat has the same number of fingers as my pet alligator. Isn't that a quinky dink? One of the main arguments Darwin used for his theory was that of homology, these odd similarities between very different animals. Why would they be so similar unless they were related? And this does make sense. After all, take siblings. They look pretty similar. They're closely related. Then take cousins or third uncles or former roommates or that weird guy down the street who's always going on about how he's a real human, but you're pretty sure he's just a stack of goblins in a trench coat. You can't fool me. I'm onto you. Anywho, Darwin wasn't the first one to notice this, but he did harness it as a central proof in the origin of species. It's to this day used as great evidence for evolution, but is it really? Here's the story. Careful observers for a long time have noticed that very different creatures have very similar bits. These sorts of ideas date all the way back to Aristotle. If we fast forward to the 1800s, anatomist Sir Richard Owen coined a term for these observations, homology. Take a look at this guy. He's got an arm that starts with one bone, followed by two bones, and then lots of tiny bones for the wrist and fingers and whatnot. Great for grabbing stuff and high-fiving. Whales and dogs have basically the same structure, but they're not so good at those things. Why in the world would that be the case? Before Darwin, biologists chalked this up to common design. Just like a painter has a particular style and reuses similar colors or themes that he likes across a lot of his work, so the thinking went, similarities in animal design pointed to a common designer. A few years later, along comes Darwin, and he figured that these structural similarities were important evidence for his theory of evolution. So, rather than a common designer, he instead credited common ancestry. But which is the proper explanation for these obvious similarities? Enter biologist Tim Barra. Guys, 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 I've got a really good illustration. It'll totally put this question to bed. If you look at a 1953 Corvette and compare it to the latest model, only the most general resemblances are evident. But if you compare 53 and 54 side by side and so on, the descent with modification is overwhelmingly obvious. The evidence is so solid and comprehensive that it can't be denied by reasonable people. In using this analogy, Dr. Barra actually demonstrates precisely the opposite of what he intended. Here's why. A succession of even very similar forms doesn't demand common descent. It could, in this case it does, instead point to a common designer. These guys, the engineers at Chevy. Intelligent agents are free to reuse things however they want. Just like I use the same password, Fluffy Bunny 123 for everything I do online. So the question remains open, is homology due to common design or common descent? Because the argument was so central to Darwin's case, his followers eliminated the question by simply redefining the word from simple similarity to meaning similarity due to common ancestry. They baked Darwinism into the definition of the word. Homology now typically means similarity due to common ancestry. It's a clever way to end an argument if you can get away with it, but for anybody paying attention, it's a baldly circular one. Common ancestry because common ancestry. We gotta, we gotta flag, flag all the play, play circular reasoning, reasoning illegal, illegal use of logic, logic five-yard five penalty, repeat the fourth grade. grade. Oh, come on, no serious biologist could possibly make that mistake. Nobody defines homology that way and then uses it as evidence for evolution. Come on, people couldn't possibly be that dumb. The circular argumentation is still regularly used in high school, even college-level textbooks, and many a YouTube video. The surprising thing is that many otherwise very smart people didn't realize this. However, more and more people are seeing the problem for what it is. So what are the options in trying to solve this problem and escape the vicious circularity? Seeing their success at redefining homology, some try to redefine circular reasoning too. Huh, all right, let's, let's see here. Whoa, 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 it's not circular reasoning. Let's call it uh, reciprocal illumination. Fancying up a term doesn't really change the argument. Did you order a pizza? I told you I'm making meatloaf. Oh, this isn't pizza, it's an elliptical caloric transmission device. Oh, okay. Gahool! Wait a second. Other attempts were made to escape the circularity, but they had to give up on homology as evidence. And instead, they looked to other lines of evidence for common ancestry, namely DNA. Eyeballing bones was a bit subjective anyway, it's kind of like trying to guess what someone's thinking by looking at their face. <laughs> oh wow, I wonder why he looks so sad. You think somebody died? It's hit or miss. But if you could look deeper by, say, reading his diary, you'd be able to see what's going on with far more precision. Dear diary, today was all you can eat taco Tuesday and I forgot to wear my stretchy pants. I could only eat seven tacos and they forgot to add extra guac. This day couldn't get any worse. This is pretty much exactly what scientists do when sequencing DNA. 
they're able to move to the more objective realm of cold, hard numbers. If you look at different creatures' DNA, the rule of thumb is the more similar, the more closely related, and vice versa. Biologists expected to see a gradual branching path of DNA mutations from species to species, and they did find some success. Take for instance this little guy. He's a gene called cytochrome C. You can find a version of him in such places as your handsome or beautiful self, chimpanzees, dogs, moths, even yeast. He's one of the most commonly sequenced portions of DNA, so it's a great test case to see if the similarities hold up and point toward common ancestry. So, if we compare your cute little cytochrome C to this ugly, hairy chimpanzee cytochrome C, they look exactly alike. Weird. With dogs, there's about 90% similarity. Moths, about two-thirds similar. And yeast, only about half similarity. Wow, just what we'd expect. These results must be really strong evidence of common ancestry. Whoa, no! Who let you in here? Shoo! Get out of here! Meet Cytochrome B. He's a lot like C, except he likes to throw monkey wrenches into Darwin's expectations. He's just one example of many. If Darwinism is true, we should be able to construct a reasonably consistent family tree, pretty much no matter what genes we compare. But that's far from the case. In reality, using genes like Cytochrome C as evidence for common ancestry is just a good example of molecular cherry picking. Depending on what genes are used, biologists will come up with wildly different ancestry and contradictory trees of life. Comparing different animals' cytochrome B genes, scientists found cats and whales cavorting in the primate club, kicking poor little cute little tarsiers out into the cold, frogs and birds and fish carrying on together in their own strange little group, and even sea urchins masquerading as chordates. It's madness! Molecular evidence, as it turns out, does very little to support homology. It's basically a big, wet blanket for the hopeful biologists who study the field. So, homology can't be used as evidence for evolution because it assumes the very thing it's trying to prove. And when biologists try to fix it by pointing to DNA or other areas, it only further undermines the case. Now, to be fair, doing away with homology doesn't necessarily disprove Darwinism, but it is illustrative of the kind of lazy thinking that's common among many Darwinists. Bad arguments can simply get passed on uncritically. All homology proves is that scientists are just like everyone else, people, and we can be uncritical of things that we want to believe. But what about all the other lines of evidence? We've got biogeography, embryology, antibiotic resistance, whale evolution, even vestigial organs for crying out loud. Is this kind of lazy thinking when dealing with evidence for evolution a one-off mistake in biology, or is it more pervasive? That's a great question for another video.